Chapter 2, Alpha and Omega by Joshua Foster. You are Alpha and Omega. We worship you, O Lord. You are worthy to be praised. You are Alpha and Omega. We worship you, O Lord. You are worthy to be praised. This simple yet powerful song of praise, sung by the gospel singer Israel Holton and New Breed, based off a song they learned in Zimbabwe, is referencing the statement God made throughout the Bible, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Few other statements about God in the Bible have more significance and meaning in Christianity than this. This is a statement that encapsulates the extreme power that our Almighty God has. So as I begin this word of teaching and encouragement that God has placed on my heart, I ask you to please pray with me and for me for a sermon entitled Alpha and Omega. Let us pray. A charge to keep I have, a God to glorify, a never-ending soul to save fitted for the sky. Father God, I come to you now asking you to hide me as I share this word from you. God, speak to me and through me and allow me to help us realize that you, God, are the Alpha and the Omega and that you are beyond worthy of even our most relentless praise. As we meet you in your word, O God, and try to distinguish this truth from error, allow this message to be an encouragement and teaching to your chosen people. This I pray in your holy name. Amen. Passages of scripture that I will be focusing on today is found in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, and also in the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 13. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, all things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Revelation chapter 22, verse 13 says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. May the Lord add a blessing to the readings and the hearing of his word. So in this message, I'll be focusing on two main points. The first being what it means for God to be the beginning, and the second meaning what it is for God to mean in the end. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. This verse is one of the more challenging verses in the Bible to break down and comprehend. So I feel the best place to start is by breaking down the main theme of this verse, the word, word. In Greek, word translates to logos. During my previous academic encounters with the word logos, one of the main people to bring it up throughout history was the philosopher Aristotle. Aristotle explained that this word was to be the logic and the reasoning behind all unexplainable things. In Greek theology, you would see this described as divine reason. In our Christian theology though, this divine reason or logos is used to describe Jesus Christ, who is the fleshly embodiment of God. This is a spot on description of who God is to us. God epitomizes both the English definition of the word as well as the Greek definition of logos. He is the spoken word as he created this universe by simply speaking things into existence. He is the written word as he is the inspiration and the reason for the Holy Bible. And he is also the logos because he is the divine reason behind everything that is, that has been, and that ever will be. As the passage continues, when it says, he, is, he was in the beginning with God, all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And this is saying that God was the beginning, and with him all things were, all things being and are given life, whether it was through birth as an infant, 
or whether it is being the rebirth as a saved child of God. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 16, Paul says, He, referring to Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, or all things were created through him and for him. This is simply a confirmation of the fact that God, the Trinity, was himself, the one and the true beginning, or in Greek, the Alpha. As we continue on into the book of Revelation, God is not only the beginning, though, but he is also the end. To the secular world, with every beginning, there is an end. But for Christians, the fact that God is the beginning and the end, we ourselves do not have to face an end to ourselves. But this idea of Omega is much more than just a symbol of God being the end of a destination. If he simply said that he was just the Alpha, the beginning of all things, without attaching Omega to it, a big portion of who God actually is would be missing. By bookending the statement being Alpha and Omega also shows the inclusion of everything in between. Think of Alpha and Omega as in terms of A to Z in the Greek alphabet. In this analogy, it would mean that God is not only Alpha and Omega, but he is also Beta and Kappa and Delta and Gamma and everything else in between. This is a huge piece of Christianity that we must realize. It's not enough to think of God as just the beginning and the end. Just as being baptized as a child in the beginning doesn't mean you will automatically jump into being with God in the end without the in-between. Every step of the way in between should be steps toward God. The statement of Alpha and Omega is one of totality and, in and inclusion. And because of this statement, we can be assured that Jesus is more than just Alpha and Omega. He is everything we need him to be, whenever we need him to be it. And as our brother in Christ, Philip Nation, a writer for LifeWay Christian Resources, shares with us, we can see that this is the fact in every single book of the Bible. In Genesis, God is the creator and the promised redeemer. In Exodus, he is the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he is the high priest. In Numbers, he is the water in the desert. In Deuteronomy, he is the curse for us. In Joshua, he is the commander of the army of the Lord. In Judges, he is the deliverer from injustice. In Ruth, he is our kinsman and our redeemer. In 1 Samuel, he is the prophet, the priest, and the king. In 2 Samuel, he is the king of grace and love. In 1 Kings, he is a ruler greater than Solomon. In 2 Kings, he is the powerful prophet. 1 Chronicles, he is the son of David that is coming to rule. In 2 Chronicles, he is the king who reigns eternally. In Ezra, he is the priest proclaiming freedom. In Nehemiah, he is the one who restores what is broken. In Esther, he is the protector of the people. In Job, he is the mediator between God and man. In Psalms, he is our song in the morning and in the night. In Proverbs, he is our wisdom. In Ecclesiastes, he is our meaning for life. In Song of Solomon, he is the author of faithful love. In Isaiah, he is suffering servant. In Jeremiah, he is the weeping Messiah. In Lamentations, he is the sumer of God's wrath for us. In Ezekiel, he is the son of man. In Daniel, he is the stranger in the fire with us. In Hosea, he is the faithful husband even when we run away. In Joel, he is the sender of his spirit to his people. In Amos, he is the deliverer of justice to the oppressed. In Obadiah, he is the judge of those who do evil. In Jonah, he is the greatest missionary. In Micah, he is the caster of our sin. In Nahum, he is the proclaimer of future world peace. In Habakkuk, he is the crusher of injustice. In Zephaniah, he is the warrior who saves. In Haggai, he is the restorer of our worship. In Zechariah, he is the Messiah pierced for us through prophecies. In Malachi, he is the son of righteousness who brings healing. In Matthew, he is the Messiah who is the king. In Mark, he is the Messiah who is the servant. In Luke, he is the Messiah who is the deliverer. In John, he is the Messiah who is a God in the flesh. In Acts, he is the spirit who dwells in his people. In Romans, he is the righteousness of God. In 1 Corinthians, he is the power and love of God. In 2 Corinthians, he is the down payment of what's to come. In Galatians, he is our very life. In Ephesians, he is the unity of our church. In Philippians, he is the joy of our life. In Colossians, he is the holder of the supreme position. In 1 Thessalonians, he is our comfort in the last days. In 2 Thessalonians, he is our returning king. In 1 Timothy, he is the savior of the worst sinners. In 2 Timothy, he is the leader of the leaders. In Titus, he is the foundation of truth. In Philemon, he is our mediator. In Hebrews, he is our high priest. In James, he is the mature of our faith. In 1 Peter, he is our hope in times of suffering. 
In 2 Peter, he is the one who guards us from false teaching. In 1 John, he is the source of all fellowship. In 2 John, he is the God in the flesh. In 3 John, he is the source of all truth. In Jude, he is the protector from our stumbling. And in Revelations, he is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. So as I close this sermon, remember that our God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, is not only the almighty Alpha and the Omega, but is that and everything in between. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen.